Okay, in this video, I'm going to go over a few of the remaining settings that I wanted to cover of the Pixar Surface. It's not going to cover everything in the Pixar Surface shader, but it's going to cover a lot of the extra attributes that you would want to adjust on your material. So, first things first, I'm going to start with some additional specular settings. So in order to do this, I'm actually going to make this more like a metal. So I'm going to go ahead and bring the diffuse color to black to turn off the diffuse. I'm going to push the face and edge color up to white, close to white in this case. Um, and we're going to take a look at uh, this menu set right here, this advanced menu. It doesn't matter if we're in physical mode or artistic mode. Um, we just want to see this advanced menu. So uh, here is going to be uh, the first thing we're going to look at is our specular model. So this is essentially when we're calculating our shading function. Um, this is how we are resolving the specular um, reflections. So it's, it essentially controls how the fall off and the shape of our reflections. So as it goes from bright to um, no reflection, um, it has a particular fall off to it. And so in this case, uh, by default, it's going to be using Beckman, which is a very, let me get rid of this one which is a very mirror-like uh, reflection, or it has very mirror-like uh, fall off to it. So it doesn't have a very soft transition between um, one point and another point. So I'm going to go ahead and snapshot this so we can compare results later. And we just do that by doing right-click, command, snapshot. That mine's up to a hotkey. Okay, I want to set this to GGX now, which is a different model. And it might not be very easy to see without a little bit of roughness. Yeah, it's a little hard to see without roughness. So I'm going to bring the roughness up a little bit, maybe up to like 1.32. All right, let's go ahead and get rid of that again. All right, so uh, data's a little too high. I'll do like right there. Okay, let's hope this works. <laughs> All right, so this is a GGX now. So I'm going to do a wait for it to resolve for a second, snapshot, go back to Beckman, wait for it to clear up a little bit. Okay and then we're going to compare them. So you can see here with the GGX, um, we start to get like a softer tail or fall off to our reflection or our uh, specular highlights. Um, and with Beckman, you get more of a mirror-like result. So I'm going to stick to GGX just for this example. And generally speaking, I think most dielectrics, the GGX is pretty good. Um, it's got a little bit more of a natural light fall off than so now we're going to take a look at anisotropy. So anisotropy, right now, this object is being isotropic, which means that at a certain point, it's not um, having any sort of prejudice towards a certain direction for your specular reflections. All of your specular reflections are uh, reflecting equally in all directions. Um, with anisotropy, we're actually going to simulate um, linear parallel grooves on the surface. So they're, um, here, I'll show you guys what that looks like. So, and then again, this is another thing that we need to kind of turn up roughness to start to see. Okay, so let me set that back to zero. And again, let's go ahead and get a snapshot going. Snapshot, and then we'll pull this anisotropia. All right, so essentially uh, on a surface like a record player or a CD or a brushed metal, um, what you have is you have scratches, grooves, um, uh, ridges on that surface that all go parallel and or parallel in the same direction. So in this case, this would be simulating actually linear groups going this way. And so usually you get those stretched specular reflections going in the opposite direction of those um, linear groups or the perpendicular direction. So uh, please refer to my second part of the uh, physically based rendering and materials lecture to get a better idea or examples of how this works, but generally speaking, um, these linear grooves create this stretched highlight effect. Oh, and I almost forgot, I wanted to mention this directionality here. So right here, by default, um, if you set the value from at zero, it's isotropic. It's reflecting in all directions. If you set this in the positive direction, it's going to start stretching them vertically, and I'll show you what that means on the UV editor in a second. Not necessarily vertically, it actually depends on how your UVs are laid out. And then if you go in the negative direction, it's going to start stretching out horizontally. You can see now they're stretching in the uh, bi-tangent or perpendicular direction. So if I take a look at this, I'm going to go back, set this back to uh, close to 1, so maybe like 0.8. So I just want to show you here, I have my UVs pulled up right here. 
and I'm just going to take this part, which is the main body, and you'll see once I rotate this, I'm going to rotate this to like a 75 degree angle or something like that. But you can see now they're actually, this probably flips upside down, I should probably flip the other way. But you can see now that those reflections are going uh, in an angle direction, so it's very much based on how your UVs are laid out. So it's something to keep in mind if you are working with something that's anisotropic, is that these, um, unless you're using a texture map to really control it, um, the uh, direction of your UVs that laid out is really important as well. So let's go ahead and set that back to the way it was. So for this next attribute, I'm actually going to be plugging in a texture map to show you guys what it looks like, because it doesn't really work without a texture map. Um, so this is the shading tangent. The shading tangent is going to be controlling the direction of the anastrotropy on top of this positive and negative value. So it's just like most texture maps, it's going to be modifying that attribute across the surface and varying it. So let's go ahead and plug one of those. So I'm going to have pull this over. Let's see if we can get some more screen real estate up over here. Maybe I'll just close that catalog. And let's push this over here for a second. I could have skipped this part and not made you guys watch it, but you guys can watch me do it. All right, so I'm going to pull over the hypershade. Um, I'm going to be going over hypershade in, in a later video, uh, but I just wanted to show you guys what this looks like. So here I have my material, and I'm going to go ahead and middle mouse click and drag this node onto the attribute to go ahead and automatically plug it in here. So here I'm getting that brushed metal effect, and I'm doing that by plugging in a, let's go ahead and let it resolve for a second. You guys can see that. So we're getting these like linear grooves, um, but we're actually getting a breakup and a shape in it. So you actually can feel those uh, um, groove marks in the surface. So if I come over here and take a look at what my texture map looks like, it's essentially just linear noise and I just stretched it a little bit more. Um, but it, they're just essentially lines of varying values of white and black. And so uh, this is using this node here called the Pixar tangent field. So the Pixar tangent field is essentially going to be taking an input texture map and turning it into um, tangent directions for that anisotropic um, uh, shading tangent value. So uh, here it can take two different types of values, uh, input rotation, input vector. And let's go ahead and take a look at what those look like. So here I've gone ahead and plugged in two different texture maps into this Pixar tangent field node which is what is driving our shading tangent. So on this Pixar tangent field node, just going to convert our texture map into the direction our anisotropy is going to be um, bending our specular highlights into, um, we have a input rotation and input vector value. They both respectively control the same thing. Input rotation is expecting a black and white image input. And it's going to uh, essentially use those black and white values to uh, determine a rotation direction, 0 to 180. You know, is it pointing in uh, 0 degrees, which maybe would be right this direction, and then going around to 180 degrees again. You would say, Caleb, that's not 180 degrees, this is 180 degrees over here. But when you're talking about uh, like a linear direction, right, so if, if it's pointing in this direction, it's also pointing in the other direction, bilinear, I don't know. Um, so then if I uh, am pointing in this direction, it's also pointing in this direction because it's kind of like a linear um, effect. So that might not have been a great example or a great description, but just don't worry about it. So it's essentially from 0 to 180. Um, and then this one right here is taking a 2D vector input. So it's going to be using a colored texture image to determine the direction that the um, uh, anisotropy is pushed in. So let's go and take a look at first the vector one, which is what I have plugged in. So it's using a 2D vector, so a two dimension vector. So we have an X value, which it's kind of rotated incorrectly, but this would be the red, uh, which is X and Y, or sorry, X direction, left and right. And then green would be the Y direction. So that would be up and down. Um, and it's only using two dimensions because we don't use that third dimension Z uh, or blue. We're just worried about X and Y relative to the surface. So if you ever see these types of texture maps, right, where it's red and green, and also purple, um, that or blue, sorry, um, when those combine together, they usually give you like a vector direction. And you can see when they, uh, as they increase, they're starting to blend together up here. Um, so in this case, black would be pointing down, green would be pointing up, um, red would be pointing to the left, and or black would be pointing to the left, and red would be pointing to the right. Um, so those combine together to give directions in a circle. 
And so that gives us something that looks like this. So here, down here, I am going to go ahead and plug in a single value because it's just a black and white map and all red, green, and blue channels are the same. And we'll just disconnect that. We didn't have to, but I'm just going to just to make it simpler. So here on this one, I have a radial ramp. Um, and so it's going again from black to white, uh, or sorry, from 0 to 180. So that white value to the black value, it's um, as it progresses from those value between those values, it gives us a rotational direction and it loops back on itself. So again, if I take a look at this, we have again those uh, uh, those values there. The other attributes we'll want to look on this is rotation offset. This is if um, you know your texture map looks good, but the overall effect or banding is happening in the wrong direction. You could use this, like let's say, on this. I'm just looking at this one. I didn't want this going in this direction. You know, I would go ahead and rotate it so that it's going in a direction I like. In this example, it's not great. Like. It's not very useful, um, but it's there. Rotation range is going to be controlling the, uh, essentially the range of different directions that it can push in. And we'll see this more on the other texture maps, but if I bring this down to a lower value, um, it's gonna have less of an effect. And you'll see actually, because it doesn't go all the way back to 180 or 360, I guess, um, we actually have a discontinuity there because it's going, in this case, it's multiplying it by like 30% of was it a zero to, oh, okay, zero to 360. I've been saying, uh, okay, anyways, you guys pretend I didn't mess up there. All right, so it's scaling that from like zero to 120 in this case, so it doesn't go all the way back onto itself. Um, so this is essentially controlling that um, that range there. And so if you want to have like maybe, if you're using a texture map and you want this to have less of like a dramatic contrast or effect, you can use that rotation range. So I want to go ahead and switch back to that other setup I have. So here's that same texture map with that um, those linear grooves. Again, it looks something like this, right? Um, and what you can do is you can solo that tangent field to kind of see the effect and um, how it's inputting, right? So we can kind of see that effect there. Um, I like to use a remap node. Um, again, this is getting a little far ahead, but if you guys end up, you know, knowing how to do texturing or you want to come back to this video, you can kind of refer to this. But a remap node is going to be adjusting our value range. So if I set this to different uh, values, I can get higher or lower contrast. So if I take the output range, for instance, and I compress it, I'm going to get a lower contrast uh, result, right? And if I stretch them apart, I'm going to get uh, not necessarily a higher contrast result. Really, we get the higher contrast result usually by affecting the inputs. So when we bring the inputs closer together, we actually get higher contrast. Ooh. So something like that. Um, and if we bring the output closer together, and I'm not going to go into the details of why that is in this video, um, if we bring the outputs closer together, we get a lower uh, contrast result. And so we can use that to our advantage here if we want to have really kind of soft. So right now I have it kind of soft here, which is actually creating a pretty great result. Um, let's go ahead and bring that catalog back, and I'll go ahead and snapshot that. Um, and I'll come back over to that remap node, and I'm going to bring that contrast back to a higher value and we'll just increase it a little bit. And then we're going to compare the results. So here's with that higher contrast. And you can already see that's looking sharper and maybe even deeper, right? And this looks a little bit softer and shallower. Um, so you can use a remap node to control that. I could also, let's go back over here. Actually, we'll, uh, yeah, we'll here, set this to zero, one, and I'll just bring that value in. So I'm going to go ahead and snapshot this again. Um, and I'm going to come over here. And same thing as I mentioned before, we can use that rotation range to control um, essentially how um, how far it's going to, how far those differences are going to be between the rotation directions between black and white. So in this case, it's only 20% of that uh, or 360, right? So it's pretty small. Um, if I put that all the way up to one, we're going to get much much more drastic results between those two directions, All right? So here's here's where it was a second ago, um, and here's where I have, I'm using that full rotation range. So this can really help you dial in both the remap node and this rotation range value, dial in that effect so it's not quite so um, harsh in certain cases. And again, that rotation offset, so right now they're kind of stretched. Well, it's really kind of hard to tell unless I use like a really small rotation range. 
So I'm going to bring that pretty small. So you can see this is stretching in this direction. If I went to go the other direction, I would just bring that down to, I think, 90? Yeah, close to 90. Um, and it should start rotating the other direction. Um, it kind of is. You can see that. Now it's starting to go horizontal instead of vertical. So, and then we can plug a lot of different texture maps in. Uh, for instance, here I have a Voronoi pattern. Um, so it's just a noise pattern. Oh, it's not plugged into anything, so it's not showing anything. So let's plug that into this one. So the Voronoi pattern looks like this. All right, it's just black and white um, noise map that I created. And this is all, this is the texture map, it's just a node inside a render man. Um, so I just, you know, I have this remap node plugged in to control the um, range of those black and white values. Um, and then it's creating this uh, tangent field effect. Um, so it's um, essentially changing the direction those polygons are facing for the anisotropy um, purposes. And so then we get this kind of like flaky effect, which is pretty cool. There's also a node called Pixar Flakes, um, but that plugs into a different type of attribute. And we're not going to worry about that right now. Um, there's a lot of cool things you can do. And I'll show you guys one more example from my lectures. I'm not going to set it up here, but I want to show you here uh, in a second. Okay, here uh, in this example, what they did is they plugged in this smudgy fingerprint um, texture map. And on the right hand side, they've only plugged into the roughness, which means that, you know, where it's white, it's essentially um, rougher. And where it's black, it's uh, glossier or sharper, those reflections. Um, so it, it works pretty well, right? It gives it a lot of variation, but it doesn't quite add all the dimensionality we would expect with this. On left hand side, they also plugged it into the anisotropy. And so here you can see as it rotates, we're actually getting, you can look at it right there with that smudge, scratchy stuff right there. Um, we're getting that banding effect. Um, and so it feels like there's almost like oil that's been from your fingers that have been like kind of smudged and drawn across it. Um, and so that anisotropy, depending on your shading situation, can add some extra dimensionality to it. You can really see those specular reflections changing with it. So this next thing, we're going to take a look at how to set up subsurface scattering. So subsurface scattering, as a recap, is the effect of light penetrating deeper within the surface and picking up color and bleeding it into the shadows. So um, all dielectrics, so nonmetals, um, are slightly translucent, so light is allowed to penetrate through them to some degree. Most dielectrics are going to have very, 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 very short um, scattering distances, so light doesn't isn't able to go super deep into them. Um, so we usually don't actually have to calculate like the model's shape or thickness um, and more advanced color attributes and shading attributes. Um, because most of those distances are so negligible. And so we use um, that diffuse attribute. But in this case, uh, on certain materials that are softer or appear softer, they're not necessarily actually softer in real life, but they have a softer appearance, and that's because light is allowed to penetrate deeper through them. So in all these examples like flesh, organic stuff, um, things like jade or wax or amber, certain types of marble, right? Um, they have a softer appearance because light can travel deeper into them. Um, and it kind of diffuses and makes the um, um, details on the surface uh, softer in appearance. And so normally for this subsurface quote unquote effect, um, we're using the diffuse channel because like I said, most of those distant, most dielectrics that distance that light is traveling beneath the surface is so shallow that we're using kind of like a really cheap approximation, but it works. It looks great on most materials and it's very um, cost efficient. Um, but when we have things like skin, this doesn't have, or let's say uh, marble or wax, this feels too hard. And that's because we're not getting that light bleeding. So in order to do this, we're going to be using this setting down here, the subsurface. So right now the gain is set to zero, which means it's not on. And so again, um, because diffuse and subsurface are technically calculating the same shading parameters, we want to make sure that we're using either one or the other. So if you're not using uh, subsurface, you're using diffuse, again, unless it's a metal. And um, if you're using uh, subsurface, you want to make sure you're not using diffuse. So in this case, I'm going to bring this up to one. Let's go ahead and first, I'm going to take a snapshot of this so we can have a comparison that we can look at later on. Let's wait for it to resolve a second. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and come in here, snapshot that. And so I'm going to go ahead and make sure this diffuse is set to black. 
and we're going to bring the subsurface up and set it to 1. I want to make sure this surface color is set to the same as this guy right here. Uh, and I don't know what this guy is. I think, oh, it's that one. Okay, there you go. So I'll come over here, make sure those have the same surface color. So already you can see this is having like a huge impact on it. And that's because this is really deep right now. Um, but we'll take a look at this just to show you guys. So what we're seeing here is first that light is bleeding into the shadow area. So a lot of that surface detail is now being kind of blended away. So there's like those, there's like maybe a little extra um, bumps and ridges right here. And then when we're looking at it in the subsurface, a lot of that stuff starts to get erased. The specular brings it back. So keep that in mind when you have a specular reflection, the specular is going to kind of it's not going to lose its crispness um, because of subsurface. It'll lose its crispness for other reasons. But on the diffuse side, so we can look down here where that specular reflection is really dim, um, we're seeing a lot of that detail just bleed away. Um, we're also getting color bleeding. So this is based on the under the surface color. So in this case, it's kind of like a peachy color, which is maybe like a flesh uh, or maybe an apple. So something that has like a warm tone under it. So like on flesh, you know, um, we have you know, blood vessels and t muscle fibers and tissue um, and fat. And so it's kind of in this warm yellow range, warm orange yellow range. Um, and so um, this is kind of a default, but you can always change that. So um, as that light travels through, it picks up that color and leads it into the shadow areas. So those are the main effects. So let's take a look at those settings for us. So, I mean, first I just wanted to note, you guys can tell that looks a lot softer. This feels really hard. This feels really soft and almost fleshy. Okay. So we're going to come in here and play around with these settings. So I'm going to go ahead and again, snapshot. So first, I'm actually going to take a look at, I'm not going to worry about the gain. Gain is essentially how, um, is it on or off? Um, color is going to be the surface color. So that's essentially the surface color with the normal diffuse shading pattern to it. Um, not picking up any under, under the surface color or anything like that. None of that subsurface color. It's just the surface color calculation. Um, this distance value is going to be how deep light is traveling. So this is working actually in conjunction with the scale of your scene and the scale of your object. I'm not going to go over it here, but you want to make sure that your scale of your scene is equal to or uh, is set up correctly. So if you're setting the right um, uh, scene units, so whether you're using centimeters or meters or inches, and then that you appropriately measure your asset. So you know if you want your asset to feel like it's 10 centimeters you know, tall, you would want to make sure your scene is set into centimeters and then your uh, asset is set to uh, 10 Maya units tall, right? So in this case, Maya units would be centimeters if I set it up like that. Um, and so you can kind of eyeball this sometimes um, if you didn't set up your scene, but generally speaking, if you actually want, you can like measure, you wouldn't physically measure, but um, you could look up um, guides for measuring the scattering distance and you can actually use that mean free path distance in conjunction with that your size of your object and the size of your scene or the units that your scene set in um, and actually get like realistic scattering depth or distances. So right now this is just cranked up to super high. So I bring this down pretty low. We're gonna get, I'll go ahead and let it resolve for a second. You also notice, um, especially as it's uh, resolving, you're gonna get a lot of noise and a lot of colored noise. Um, so it's something to keep in mind is that subsurface scattering, not only is it more expensive, but it also takes longer to, I mean, I guess there's kind of the same thing, it takes longer to resolve. And so you're going to get a lot more noise and then that noise can sometimes carry through. Okay. So here we can see that scattering distance is much lower, right? So, you know, it's almost close to the diffuse. It's not quite, you're still getting a bit of a softening there, right? So here's our hard diffuse and here's our subsurface. And yeah, so that's just a lower value and I can set this to maybe like a medium depth value. And don't worry about the color noise for right now. Or don't worry about trying to understand it at this moment or especially while it's resolving. It can be really confusing because you'll see like crazy colors, um, but it's kind of hard to wrap your head around. Um, so usually just rely on these distances and this mean free path color and just let it resolve. So here we can see here's that 10 depth and here's that four or five depth so it's just controlling the distance it goes and this mean free path color is like i said before going to be that color that light picks up or is the wavelengths of light that are being absorbed as it travels beneath the surface 
So by default, it has that kind of pink fleshy color. Um, I can make it like a blue color. So maybe it picks up like some kind of tinted blue as it travels beneath. And so as I let that resolve um, into those shadow areas, we're going to pick up um, a little bit of a blue color. And so I recommend if you guys are going to be doing these mean free path colors, maybe we'll pick that, right? So now it's picking up kind of a blue tint. Um, it's not definitely not physically very plausible unless you had like a blue jello, maybe. I don't know. Um, but uh, we I recommend you guys look up these values. There's actually charts, including on the Renderman's website, that give you um, color values that you can set this to based on the material. So if you want it to be like marble or wax or um, something like milk or cream, then you can look up that specific values. Um, I'm going to set that back to the default. Just a quick note I wanted to add. Um, if you're not sure, uh, so for instance, if I had a wax or if I had a like a really, really thin plastic or a really, really um, soft plastic where light can penetrate through, um, if you're in doubt with what the values are and you can't find the value, like the mean free path color anywhere, um, generally speaking, you can get a pretty soft look if you just bring a, a fairly light value that's desaturated. So it loses that color pickup but we're still getting that light bleeding through. You could also use a, like, so let's say I use that example before where I choose like a blue, let's say it's something like this. Let's pretend it's like a, a blue plastic, right? Um, so you can see with this, it kind of already has that softness to it. Um, I could choose it as a, that color right there and then just make that value um, a little desaturated and a little brighter. So generally speaking, um, if we use just like a, a fairly bright, desaturated um, version of that color, we can get that um, maybe a fairly believable result of light penetrating through it. So just keep that in mind is um, you probably just want to go ahead and go with the desaturated version if you're not sure um, and just make it a fairly light value. And then uh, you could use a tinted version of your, um, your surface color, diffuse color. Um, that is just uh, desaturated. Convert to default values. Okay. Um, the last thing I'm going to talk about here. Well, let's see. There's. No, nah, we're not going to worry about that there. Um, so for the subsurface model, um, is it just again like that specular advanced model um, is just going to be a different way of calculating this. And so there's a ton of different ways to calculate subsurface scattering. I'm not going to go over most or any of them. Um, we're using Jensen Dipole. It's very simple. It's very artist friendly. Um, but you can see here we have a lot of different ex uh, versions, including the multiple mean free paths. So mean free paths is essentially the distance that light is going to be scattering on average across the surface. Um, so multiple mean free paths means that we can actually control the scattering distances at different depths. Um, so we have like a long and short gain, right? Um, and then we also have uh, like exponential path tracing and you can see these all have very different um so burley and jensen are going to and even dion better dipole they're all going to have the same artistic friendly um setup um so i recommend those for the most part um this one right here multiple of free beam paths and the other ones i would use maybe if you have more advanced setups like if you wanted to have a um deep deep um subdermal uh, uh layer and then you have like a a dermal layer um, texture map and so you want to have simulating multiple levels of absorption at different depths but for the most part i just recommend sticking to these first ones um, and that's pretty much all we need to know for for now about subsurface next up we're going to take a look at our glass settings so glass like subsurface is same thing kind of as um, our diffuse it's calculating the light traveling through the surface um, but because of shading purposes, um, glass like subsurface is more expensive. So um, when we use one of these subsurface glass or diffuse, we want to turn off the other ones because they're essentially doing the same thing. So in this case, I want to go ahead and turn that subsurface off. So we're going to set that gain down to zero. And the glass also has its own reflection um, settings. So we also want to turn off our reflectivity, which is our specular. So in this case, because I'm using physical mode, I'm just going to set that to black. Um, so essentially turning off. So I'm turning off both my diffuse and specular settings when I'm using my glass and I make sure subsurface is off, of course. So we come down here and again, we just set that to one. 
So um, this is going to be simulating light traveling through the object um, uh, in a very translucent or transparent object. So um, a transparent object or a super translucent object is going to be one that has very little scattering and absorption. So light is able to travel almost all the way through to the other side. Um, so that essentially is categorized as glass or liquids that are clear that you can see through or um, uh, ice, something like that, or uh, yeah, you get the point. So the main settings we're going to have here is obviously the gain, which is going to turn it on. We're going to have our refraction color, which is going to be the color of light absorption. So if I set this to, let's bring this to like a blue, let's turn off color barrier, blue. That's like a purpley. Well, that's a nice thing about color management is um, it just changes it for our display, um, but it just makes color picker really annoying to use. Um, and so, yeah. So it's not super intuitive sometimes, like the colors you choose and what you're seeing in the viewport. Um, but this is essentially going to be changing the um, absorption color and essentially changing the color of the glass or whatever liquid it's supposed to be. Roughness is going to be controlling two attributes at the same time. If you hover over this, it actually tells you roughness for the glass reflection. Also used for glass refraction, unless a separate glass refraction roughness value is specified. So by default, if this is set to negative one down here, refraction roughness, this is controlling both the reflection quality and the refraction, the refracted light quality. So the light bouncing off and the light traveling through. And so right now they both have a very low roughness. So if I increase that roughness, so I make it a little bit rougher, you can see both the reflections and the refracted light is really blurry, right? So if I set this, if I change this from a non-negative value, so let's set this to zero, you'll see that refracted light is clear again. It's a little hard to see with my all my texture maps on here, which I should probably just turn off. Um, but we can see that stuff coming through now, like we can see the inside of our teapot. Um, the reflections are still uh, rough, and so let's go ahead and snapshot this. So I can bring this back down to zero too, and now we have really crisp reflections, right? But that light that's um, coming through the object is the same, so that's not being affected. Let's go ahead and snapshot that, and then I can go ahead and if I change that refraction roughness, that inside of the teapot is uh, set that to the lower value. So that inside of the teapot is being blurred out. And in this case, it's also affecting the surface reflections. And so this is just something that I personally probably am not fully understanding about the shader. Um, but in this case, I guess the refraction roughness is also going to be affecting the specular reflections, um, which is interesting. Um, not exactly what I remember doing, but uh, I'm probably just not understanding it fully. But for the most part, um, the idea is that uh, you, on certain materials, you're usually going to have your refraction and your reflection kind of the same roughness or similar roughness. But if you want that control, you can set the refraction roughness separately from the specular roughness if you just make these um, refraction roughness value non-negative. So if I set that back to negative, this slider right here is controlling both at the same time. If I come down here to advance, we have quite a few settings. We have our anisotropy values, which I'm not going to cover again. It's the same thing. Um, we have our refractive index. So our refractive index, if you remember from lectures, is going to control um, how much light is bending from one medium to the other. So this is assuming that the outer medium is air, which is pretty much close to one. So uh, we're just going to it's going to assume that that when it's calculating those that light bending. So by default right here is set to 1.5, which I think is about a glass value. And you should have some settings here. So we can switch between different uh, index of refraction. So we got oil, right, 1.47. Um, uh, it'd be nice if they did that for color too, but I guess not. Um, and so the lower the value, um, the less of an effect it's going to have. So it's almost because this index of refraction, if it's the same as the outer medium, um, essentially, it's not going to refract or bend light, and it's also not going to reflect light, reflect light. So remember, refractive index is controlling the bending of light through the object and also the, the intensity of our reflections. So the greater the difference between the outer medium and the material um, in their refractive index, the more light is reflected and the more light is bent. 
So if as I increase this, let's 1.1, right, we're starting to see with the very low index refraction, very dim reflections and very little bending of light inside there. And if I bring this up to like, let's say three, which is kind of insanely high. Um, now we're getting, it's kind of hard to see with the reflections. Let's go and bring the reflections off. I mean, you can tell the reflections are like super high. Um, but if I bring that reflection gain down to zero, uh, actually we kind of need that reflection gain to see the light coming through too. It's a weird setup. Um, and I, I will be honest, I don't fully understand um, how it, the reflection and the refraction are both affecting each other on glass. Um, I know how to control them separately, but it gets a little confusing. So I'll just, just want to be honest there. All right. So we'll go ahead and set that back up and I'll bring this down to a reasonable value. So 1.5, but you get it. So refraction is going to, refractive index is going to be controlling how much bending and how much reflection our um, object or our material is having. Fin is going to be, um, let me go ahead and do a really quick setup here. Okay, I wanted to set this up on a non-hollow object. So that other teapot had like a hollow interior. This is just a sphere, so it's a solid. And so we're getting more of that refraction. I actually wanted to show this on that refraction so you can see a little bit better. So we have that refractive index. Here we have the default 1.5, which is fairly high compared to um, air. And if I bring that down to a low value, we're getting less and less bent light and we're getting less and less strong reflections. So you can see with 1.5, we're getting more of that bending effect going on um, with that lower value or not. Um, but anyways, so I also wanted to set that up so that I can show you guys. Let's set it to water 1.3. That's thin attribute right here. So this thin attribute is going to essentially treat the whole surface as a thin object that does not have an interior. So like a super thin film or a super thin glass. So um, essentially it makes it kind of effectively hollow. So um, it's going to be uh, not bending the light quite as much. So um, it can be really helpful if you want to have cheap, quick, uh, inexp inexpensive reflections. Um, and it's also great if you want to have like an object that's not hollow, um, but you want it to feel like it's like a thin, hollow object. And so in this case, we have, um, we just set that value to thin, and now it feels like a thinner material and not completely um, solid. So, and that's what it looks like with off. Now it feels dense and it has an interior and it's refracting and bending that light as it travels through. So we're not going to worry about the rest of these settings for glass. We're going to move on. Um, but just as a reminder, when you are doing glass, we want to make sure our refraction and reflection gain set to one, and we don't have our diffuse turned on, and we don't have our specular turned on. OK, I wanted to add this. It's coming a little late, but I want to uh, cover one of the glass material settings that I'd forgotten to cover in the previous recording. So what I have here is I have a Pixar surface, ignore the green parts, um, we're just worried about this orange part, um, and I've attached a glass here, right? So I just turn off the diffuse, turn off the specular, and turn up the refraction and reflection gain. I'll set that this back to its default values. So revert to default, revert to default, um, revert to default, revert to default. Okay, so we have this clear glass. So these values down here are this interior. Um, and if you look up on the RenderMan documentation page, it'll tell you that these are these values are used to essentially um, simulate a cloudy liquid that's inside the glass material. So the single scatter albedo is going to be kind of like the tint or the color, and the extinction is going to be um, which wavelengths of light are being absorbed as it travels through. So if I come in here, I'm going to go ahead and I use kind of an orangey color. And when this extinction's black, they kind of they have to go hand in hand. So when this extinction's black, um, there's no real effect. But as you can see, when I start pulling this up, this value higher, um, I'm absorbing more and more light. And if it's a grayscale value, it's absorbing the wavelengths of light equally, and this is just kind of tinting it. Uh, but you can come in here and I can use a color, like for instance, I was using a color on the opposite side of the color wheel from orange, and so it's absorbing those blue um, wavelengths of light more, and so we were getting a more saturated orange tint that's going in. And then we can combine that with our refractive roughness, to make it even cloudier in there. So I can bring that refractive up, roughness up. It's still transparent. I can still see through it, but the light is being scattered as it goes through. So this is great for any sort of uh, non-translucent liquid, um, something that's a little foggy or murky. Um, so in case this case, I'm making kind of, I guess, orange juice, which maybe would be a little bit more yellow-orange, um, something like that. 
Um, but I just wanted to cover that. Um, it's really useful for certain liquids, like I said, and certain types of, um, yeah, liquids mostly is what I can think of. Um, but you might find some other applications. Okay, we're going to take a look at three more settings, and these are kind of on the more obscure side of needing to use these for creating materials. So the first one I'm going to take a look at is right here, fuzz. Um, fuzz falls in that same category as um, the other specular reflection lobes, so it is going to be a reflectivity um, specular lobe. Um, and it's very similar to, you can think of it like the edge color, but it's kind of locked into being always fuzzy and always rough. So um, normally when I would come in here, let's switch to artistic mode, um, and I just turn on the edge color, and let's break this, let's break connection. Um, and I turn on the um, edge color and bring that up, then we're getting our reflections along the edges. And, you know, right now it's really sharp and I can make it rougher and then I get like a softer edge. And then I can use that Fresnel exponent to push those reflections closer to the edge um, or bring it down to let those reflections spread um, back out. Set that back to five and set that up a little, bright, a little brighter again and bring that roughness down. Okay. So actually, I don't know why I did that. I'm going to go ahead and show you guys fuzz. I'm going to turn off the um, uh, this primary specular, and I'm also going to set the diffuse black just so we can see this a little bit better. So if I come down here and I turn the fuzz on, you can see we're getting um, a variation of that edge color. It's not quite the same, uh, I guess, look to it, um, but it's very similar to that edge color. So I'll take that down. Let's bring that edge color up. Bring that roughness up higher. Right, it kind of has a similar look as if you did this and you brought that Fresnel exponent up higher. But like I said, it's not quite the same. So the way this works, or what this is used for, is it's supposed to be simulating, as you might expect from here, fuzz. So really short hairs um, on certain types of fabric like velvet or I guess any type of really fuzzy or wooly cloth. Um, and it's this these small tiny hairs that are on the surface that catch these edge rim lights. Um, and so this is just supposed to be simulating that effect of having tiny, fuzzy, tiny, tiny, tiny little fuzzy hairs, um, and they catch that edge rim light in a, in a particular way that you'll see very often on clothing. If you take a look at like a black piece of clothing, you'll see it has like this kind of soft, fuzzy edge color to it. Here you can see, I just brought this picture of black velvet. And so we're getting that really soft edge color um, specular reflection that is caused by little tiny hairs on the fabric that is uh, picking up that light along the edges. So that's fuzz, and um, if the fabric color was different, so if it was like a red fabric or red velvet, you might use a red tinted color to try to um, simulate small little tiny red fabric hairs instead of white. Um, but it depends on the material and what you're going to need it for. So that's fuzz, let's go ahead and turn that off. So this next setting is a variation of specular. So much like how subsurface is kind of doing the same thing as diffuse, but just with a different shading calculation. Um, and then when we use glass, we are um, getting refraction and reflection. So we turn off our specular and our diffuse. Um, iridescence is kind of a replacement for specular. But as I mentioned in the first video, many objects maybe not many objects, but a lot of objects have a uh, multiple layers to them. So for instance, skin has like the surface, you know, like our skin surface with all the dead skin cells on top. And on top of that, uh, especially on our faces, we have like an oil layer that's transparent. So you usually have multiple layers that might have different specular reflectivity. So for instance, if I was doing skin, um, I might have like a really, you know, rough specular um, and then on top of that, I have like a shiny, glossy specular, right? And so it's simulating those multiple layers to it. Let's turn those back off. So even though iridescence is replacing a specular lobe um, or simulating replacing a specular lobe, we might, we don't necessarily, we can use it in conjunction with other specular. So iridescence is this effect where the specular reflections change color based on the direction or that angle of view. So if that surface is pointing towards the viewer or away from the viewer. And so 
This is most mostly due in nature due to um, multiple thin transparent layers that are sitting on top of each other and due to the way that these multiple layers um, are reflecting and interfering with one another those wavelengths of light then they cancel or amplify certain wavelengths or colors and so that's why depending on the angle of view we get different colors. So here uh, we're just going to go ahead and turn that effect on so I'm just going to bring the face gain up a little bit bring that edge gain up to one. You could bring the face gain up to one. It really depends on the material, um, but it's a lot like specular. Um, so I'll bring that face gain down a little lower. And uh, most of these settings here, face gain, edge gain, Fresnel exponent, and roughness are the same as you would expect from any of the specular lobes. Um, the main difference is going to be in this iridescence. So we have two different colors. We have our primary color and our secondary color. So the primary color is going to be essentially our face color. And then our secondary color is going to be the color that it transitions to along the edges. And so here, if I open this up, you can see it's going along the color wheel. So my secondary color is blue, my primary color is red. So it's going from red all the way around to blue. So you'll see it's going from red to orange to yellow to green to cyan to blue. And so if we have a very two colors on the opposite side of the color wheel, we're going to get a pretty large effect or rainbowy effect here where it's going through a lot of different colors. But if we brought these colors some closer to each other, so let's say I brought this over into the green spectrum, right? It's only going from red to green. So it's going from red to orange to yellow to green. And if I set that color just behind the primary, so the primary is right here and the secondary is right there, you can see it's going through the entire color wheel. So we're getting this really rad rainbow effect. So depending on your material um, and what its iridescent effect is, um, we can use this primary color to uh, essentially uh, modify the range of colors that's going to happen. And whether we want that to be a really tight or we want that to be a very drastic rainbowy effect as it goes through multiple colors. Yeah, I want to reset this. Revert. Okay. Um, before we switch over to the other um, iridescence mode, we're going to go ahead and take a look at a few settings. So first, we're going to have ir our anisotropy, which is going to be much like anisotropy on the other specular settings. This is just going to shape our specular reflections. Then you know we have our shading tangent, which is related to anisotropy. Those should be fairly the same. Um, bump we're going to skip for now and talk about that another time. Um, fall off speed is going to be how quickly it changes from the primary color to the secondary color. So if I have a high number, then it's going to go very quickly from that primary color to secondary color. So if I set that to 10, you'll see it's going really quickly to red to blue. So we have those first parts of that color wheel from, let's see, red to green happen really quickly, and then it slows as it goes down to blue set that to 1, and obviously if we go the opposite direction, 0.1, it's going to take longer to spread between those colors. And then that fall-off scale is going to act like a repeating. So right now, on the edge, it's going to go to blue, on the front, it's going to go to red, and if I set that to like 3, you'll see it actually goes from red to blue, and then red to blue, and then red to blue. Um, so it's how you can get like a repeating pattern if you need to on your uh, iridescence. So I'll just set that back to 1. This last setting here, flip hue direction, is essentially going to let us go in the opposite direction on the color wheel, depending on which direction it's going. So it's going from red to blue, and so if I flip that hue direction, it's going to go the opposite direction, from red to blue, but you'll see it's going through the pinks to get to blue instead of all the way this direction. So if you have a primary color and secondary color colors correct, but it's going the wrong direction, you can just click this flip hue direction to get it for you. So this is the artistic mode. If I switch over to physical mode, you can see we lose that color selection process. And this is really due to, or this is really going to be approximating um, those colors based on, um, I guess, the thickness of the film. Um, this is definitely something that's a little harder to use, um, but it's more physically accurate. And so it's simulating the thickness of that fi film. So if that film is a lower thickness, Right, we have a different banding effect of the colors and transition. If we go higher, it's kind of like getting that scale effect where it's going to increase the frequency of our um, bands. So I said that's like 1,000. Um, and let's see, let's make sure I'm not doing this wrong. I'm doing something wrong. I can tell that much. 
Okay, uh, I wasn't doing anything wrong, it's just because of my roughness. Everything started to blend together and I couldn't see it. I set this roughness really low. So you can see just like um, with that scale effect, if I set this value to higher than 800, we're going to start to get this banding effect. Um, and it's also affecting the color of our um, specular reflections um, or that iridescence, like what ranges of color it goes through. So that's uh, iridescence in a nutshell. Okay, our last setting is going to be down here under glow. So glow is going to be when our um, object is actually creating light. So it's um, not taking light that's coming in and turning, you know, reflecting it or absorbing it and re-emitting it um, or scattering it. It's actually creating light. Um, so this is something you'd find in obviously a light source. So if you had a light bulb, uh, LED lights, um, a glow stick, anything that is phosphorescent uh, or bioluminescent. So if you had like um, a glowing sea creature or a glowing mushroom, I guess, uh, or if you had um, like those stars that, you know, you had as a, so a lot of people had as a kid on their ceiling where it's like glow in the dark um, and it's actually creating and emitting light. So it's pretty simple. It just has two settings here. You have your gain and your color. So I bring gain up to one, you'll see it's going to be um, changing that surface so it's all emitting light. And because it's emitting light, you're not going to get light and shadows because every single point on the surface is now a light source. If you also had diffuse, so let's set this to that, and um, let's set the diffuse to a uh, non-black color. You know, we're still getting light coming in and affecting the surface color because it's like adding on to the light that's being emitted. Um, but uh, mostly when you see glow, this is one of the first things that looks like it's glowing is um, it's, it's starting to kind of ignore shadows because it's not taking any necessarily a light source and it's actually light being created at the surface. Um, so we have that gain value, which is just going to turn the effect on, and then we have really just this color value. Um, and the color value can be cranked up, or it can be any color, right? So I can set this to like a um, yellowy color, orange yellow, like an incandescent color. So we set that um, saturation, maybe not quite so high. And then I set that value to one, right? And you can see it's actually emitting light onto the surface. And you can see it's uh, casting light onto the surrounding objects. Depends on uh, what rendering engine it is that you're using, but um, I guess in RenderMan, it's gonna be actually creating light. Sometimes it's just a visual effect to make it look like it's glowing. Uh, but in this case, it's actually creating light. Um, we can actually increase these values. I'm going to turn off that color management. Um, we can increase those values past their original values. So I can crank this up to like maybe eight, right? And now it's going to be um, brighter. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. I'm going to go ahead and snapshot that. And we'll go back to color management. And I'll set this back to one. I'll set that to like that color again. And so you can see um, it's actually not only is it appearing hotter, but it's also casting more light as it increases past that color value. So you can use that value to increase the exposure of this as a light source. Here's a, a really cool example from the uh, RenderMan resources. Um, feel free to go check it out. I encourage you guys to take a look at it. I'm not gonna go into super detail on this, um, but this is actually using a few techniques. First, it's using a node called um, black body, which is uh, essentially like for measuring um, uh, color temperature for light sources. So it's using this theoretical um, black body object, like an object that's just uh, black metal. And then when you heat it up, it changes colors based on the temperature. So even though light sources won't actually be this temperature and it's in Kelvin, so it's not like this is 2000 Kelvin, like that light source isn't that hot, that'd be insane. Um, but it's simulating that color that would be given off by that um, black metal if that black metal was heated up to that temperature. So whenever you guys see light temperature, that's what the, why it's in Kelvin. Um, so here, uh, this black body is actually being plugged into the color node. So instead of using the uh, uh, color node, we're actually plugging this into the, uh, or instead of using the color value, we're actually plugging this in the color node. And so um, we have exposure so that we can use that to increase the brightness, right? Um, and then we have temperature, which is going to be the color of that light source. Let's bring this down lower. Ooh, I don't know if I can go that hot. There we go. I guess this is probably the range we can go in. 
And so it's going to get into a cooler blue color as that value gets higher. So those two colors are, I'm guessing, going in conjunction. And I'm not 100% fully familiar with this node, to be completely honest. It's not one that I usually use. I usually personally just use the color picker myself. But it's cool to see this and kind of be able to use like real world values if we wanted to. And working with um, color temperature is great. Um, but it doesn't seem to go up into like the blues and the cool white values. Or if it does, I just it's hard to, for me to get there. Um, it's also using a map so that it's glowing more in the center and less on the sides. So you can see here, you know, like it feels like it has a hot core to it, kind of like a neon tube, right? Um, and so that's just because um, this glow effect is stronger on the front facing um, polygons and weaker on the side facing polygons. Um, and if we, I'm just going to show you guys what the map looks like. So this is a mask that is being used. It's called Pixar facing ratio. Pixar facing ratio is just taking the facing ratio, which means um, the uh, you know value from zero to one, where it's essentially calculating the difference between the angle your camera is looking at. Like the if you imagined like a vector pointing from your camera at the surface, so that angle of that camera vector coming in and touching the surface, and the angle of the normal. So if they're the same it's zero, or in this case, one, I guess. Um, and so as they become more different, so over here, my camera angle would be, uh, let's see if I can draw on the screen really quickly. Here we go. So I have, let's say, a black sphere, or just a sphere. Um, and then we have our camera. And let's go ahead and get a different color. So if that um, camera angle coming in that way. So this is that vector, that angle that it's coming in on the surface. And at that location, right, that uh, that polygon's normal is going this direction, right? So they're effectively going to be going at the same angle, right? They're the angles. Here's the polygon. Here's that uh, um, surface normal. And here's that camera angle. Um, or normal or vector um, using the wrong terminology. These are essentially the same. So we get a value. In this case, it would be one. But um, in certain cases, it might also be zero. It um, depends on what node it is. So the facing ratio is using this as a mask. So if I had that angle coming in like this, right there, um, but my camera or my polygons normal is going in this direction. Now we have this 90 degree difference between them and so now it's going to be the opposite of what this value is. So in this case, it would be zero. Or if this was zero, that would be one. So um, essentially, it's calculating the difference between the polygons normal and the camera incoming camera ray and its direction of that vector. And so that's what that mask is using. No. OK, so if I come back over here. That's why these front faces, and that's kind of a similar idea for the Fresnel effect for our specular, um, is just calculating if the face is pointing towards us or not. So if I turn that off, you can see that is being plugged actually into the glow gain, and so um, it's making that glow effect stronger in the middle and weaker along the edges.